in Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 2. It says, This month shall be <clears throat> your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it, according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And he's talking there about the Passover. This is instituting the Passover for the, the nation of the Jews. Um, <clears throat> selecting one without spot, without blemish. Now later on, as, as time went on, as they came into the, na into the country, into the promised land, and they had uh, the temple there built at Jerusalem, when they would bring their lambs for Passover, they would be inspected by the priests to make sure that they were perfect, without blemish. And in essence, this is what we see happening to Jesus. He came in to Jerusalem on a Sunday, on what we now call Palm Sunday. And now a couple of days have passed, it's now Tuesday. But what we see here, in essence, are all the religious leaders of the Jews inspecting the Lamb of God. First Peter 1. You don't have to turn to that, but I'll, I'll read it to you. It's First Peter 1, starting at 18. It says, You were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver and gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So none of the traditions of religion or working for our salvation has anything to do with it because it's only the blood of the Lamb of God. And so, as we start, we'll start here at uh, verse 27 in chapter 11. So before we do that, though, I want to, you know, they tell you that you can't know the players unless you have a, a um, program, you know, when you go to the ball game. And so we're going to take a look at some of the players here because verse 27 says, um, speaking of Jesus in, the, in his posse, uh, when they came again to Jerusalem and he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And so we're going to see a whole gag, a whole gaggle of, of different groups coming to Jesus and inspecting him. And so I just want to bring a little bit of clarity and a little bit of understanding before we go on. <clears throat> This group here, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, that made up what we know as the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a ruling group of, of Jews, elders, chief priests, um, and scribes. There was about 70 in total. Um, they ruled Palestine for the most part from the time of Alexander the Great in 320-ish up until 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Now Alexander the Great was a Greek and he brought his whole premise was not only just to conquer the world but to bring Greek culture, Greek language, Greek morality to the world so that as they ruled everybody would kind of be on the same page. So by bringing all these things it really unified very different groups of people and made it easier for the ruling class. And then as Rome became their ruling power, the language stayed the same. 
the morality, all those things pretty much stayed the same, although the Romans were, uh, um, you know, ruled in their own way, it was still, they still reaped the benefits of the Hellenistic um, philosophy. Now, Hellenism, I just found this out, and I'm ashamed. I mean, most of you probably know this, but the, the country of Greece is actually called Helas. H-E-L-L-A-S, I believe it is. And that's where we get the word Hellenism. So it's the Greek philosophy, morality, language. That's what Hellenism is. And we see it throughout the scriptures, um, you know, the Hellenist Jews. And so that, that'll help bring clarity to it. Uh, we also have the scribes. Now the scribes were kind of the secretaries, the copyists. They would copy the scriptures and, and keep them as um, exact as possible. And then in time, after the Babylonian um, rule, when the Jews were taken into Babylon, time of Daniel, when they came back into their country, when they uh, rebuilt the wall and the temple, and they brought out the scriptures and began to read to the people, it said the scribes gave them the in essence, the meaning of it, the understanding of the scriptures, because they had not really been followed for a long time. And so the scribes then be became more of the teachers of the law, not just the copiers, but then began to teach the law. We have the Pharisees that we hear a lot about. Now, the Pharisees were one of the two main groups that ruled um, in Jerusalem, in, in, in Israel. The Pharisees came out of the scribes, um, but they kept a very strict adherence to the Torah, the law, uh, as well as what they call the traditions. Now, the traditions, remember as you read the scriptures, you read, you know, well, Gamaliel said this, or so-and-so said this, and they were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he spoke with authority. And the reason being is, to interpret the law, they came up with 613 kind of amendments to the law to bring clarity. As Hellenistic thought and culture came into their, their lives, now they had to kind of balance. New things came in that they weren't accustomed to. And so these 613 other laws, some negative, some positive, came to play. The Pharisees were very strictly holding to that. And so they prayed in certain ways. They prayed at certain times. They did, every, they did the washings, the ceremonial washing, all these things. Um, so they held the, the Torah, the traditions. Um, they resisted Hellenism, but also they had to kind of find a way to balance its influence uh, with, the, with the Jews. Um, Paul himself was a Pharisee. And so that meant that he, he talked about his righteousness, that his righteousness was without question. He was one that really paid attention to those 613 traditions. We also have the Sadducees, and they're the second big group of uh, rulers. They came out of the ranks of the priests, and they were more of a wealthy and social party, uh, but they held a very legalistic and very conservative view of the Torah. In fact, that's all they accepted, just the five books of the law, period. None of the traditions, not even the prophets, not even the other scriptures. Um, and the Sadducees were very much, you know, leaning toward Rome. They sided with Rome, and therefore they held more power than the Pharisees. But the common people sided mostly with the, with the Pharisees. Although the Pharisees rarely looked down on the common people, they kind of a love-hate relationship. They, they uh, respected the Pharisees more because they, they were a more religious sect than, than political. Um, the Sadducees, because they only held to the, to the law, if it wasn't found in the law, it didn't, it didn't hold any weight with them. And so therefore, nothing in the law says anything about a, a soul. So they didn't believe in the human soul. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. Um, they didn't believe in um, a judgment, a resurrection, life after death. Um, so they were very uh, limited in how they viewed life and what they viewed as true. Um, <clears throat> with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, because 
the temple was their whole focus, they just kind of disappeared. Uh, and at that time, then, the Pharisees became the true leaders of the Jewish people uh, and provided them a religious life apart from the temple. We refer to the Herodians. The Herodians were more or less just a political party. They um, esteemed the, the rule of the Herods as uh, kind of their, their whole thing. You know, the Herods, who were Edomites, actually, and so they were kind of half Jews, um, but mostly just political in their influence. The chief priests by this time, by the time of Christ, had become a political uh, position. And so they were appointed by uh, the government, the, the ruling government. So although the um, Sanhedrin ruled, there seems to be some influence like from from the Herods, you know, as to who would be the chief priest. And we see in, in the trial of Jesus, we see two chief priests, they call them. One was Caiaphas and one was Annas. Um, one being officially the chief priest, the other one being the kind of the godfather chief priest. And so there's a lot of confusion there, a lot of crossover. But that gives us some idea. So the chief priest eventually became a, a political appointment, like I said. Uh, and it was they themselves and their, some of their family that were kind of the elders and uh, chief priests and, the, and the, made up the Sanhedrin. And that's where we are here <clears throat> in chapter 11. Um, the chief priests, scribes, and the elders came to him. So the Sanhedrin is represented here. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do them? But Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one question and then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they responded among themselves. You can see him going into a huddle, you know. Hey. Each one looking to the other like, come on, give me the answer here, you know. If we say from heaven, he will say, then why then didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for all of them counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, uh, we don't know. And Jesus answered and said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So here we are, it's Tuesday of the week. Sanhedrin is bringing him this question, by what authority? And what they're basically saying is, hey, we didn't give you this authority. Who did? And that reminds me of myself so often I don't give Jesus the authority to do what he wants to do. I resist him. I sometimes resent him. Not me personally, but kind of my flesh, the old nature, you know, as it pops up. And that's, that's kind of what they're doing here. They're envious. They're threatened. Um, their position is being taken away because the people are anxious to hear what Jesus has to say. It's not Rome's authority. In fact, I can imagine hearing some of them saying, hey, we know who your mother is. We know what you are, and we know what we call people like you. Who gives you this authority? Where do you come from? Where do you get off telling us what to do? And that's the attitude that's flying here. They answered, we don't know. And in Greek, that would be, the term from which we get agnostic. Do you believe in God? Well, I'm an agnostic. I, I, I don't know. You know, it could be, it might not be, but I, I, I don't know. But if you translate that into Latin, it becomes ignoramus. So instead of being an agnostic, you're saying, I'm an ignoramus, you know, <laughs> which isn't so flattering. But <clears throat> they didn't accept the authority of John and because they didn't accept the authority of John, they won't accept Jesus' authority. Had they accepted John and listened to his message and repented and brought forth fruits worthy of repentance, then they would have been ready when Jesus came on the scene and they would have heard him.
Jesus is the embodiment of, of wisdom, truly. And uh, he is, he's not angry with them. He's not trying to hurt them. But he's giving them, at their level, what they need to hear. And we find that when, when God does that with us, when we've tripped up or when we have a, a wrong attitude, he meets us exactly where we are. That when he confronts us, if we respond obediently toward him, humble ourselves and agree with him, then grace just flows. If we resist, then he resists us. And that's what he's doing here. He's not putting them down. He's not trying to hurt them, not trying to win a fight. His whole idea here is to draw them to the truth in spite of their attitudes and, and what they have to say. Chapter 12. <clears throat> then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it and dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at the vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit, some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. And again, he sent them another servant. And, and at him, they threw stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully treated. And again, he sent another and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some and therefore still having one son, his beloved. He sent him, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. And therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and so they left him and went away. This is a familiar picture, this picture of the, the uh, vineyard and the wall built around it and the tower and the wine vat built. In Psalm 80, it says, You brought a vine out of Egypt, speaking of God, and cast out the nations of the Gentiles and planted it, speaking of Israel. And in Isaiah 5, it says, My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower and in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes, speaking of the results of the nation Israel, uh, their disobedience, their unbelief, uh, their turning from him in the days of Isaiah. So these are a very familiar picture to them. Um, and what, what we see is God planted the Jews, his promised people in the promised land uh, in Jerusalem, where they had their temple for worship of God. Um, as they uh, progressed in their sin, God would send prophets to them. And those, they, some they stoned, some they killed, some they tortured, some they cast out. And finally, here is Jesus coming to them, and it's the same result. It's an interesting thing I read in, in Leviticus um, 19 as part of the um, law. It says, when you plant a tree that bears fruit, in the first three years, you need to consider that fruit is uncircumcised. Don't eat it. That's not to be used for human consumption. And in the fourth year, the fruit that grows from that tree is holy unto the Lord. That's a praise unto him. And then in the fifth year, now you're free to enjoy the fruit of your labor. One of the commentators, and this is just speculation, surely, but he said, if, if each one of these verses were a year, um, 
Verse 2, you know, in the vintage time, he sent a servant. If that servant came in one year and they beat him or cast him out or killed him. And the servant, then verse 3, that another servant came. And verse 4, when Jesus came, that would have been the year that the fruit would have been dedicated to the Lord, holy unto the Lord, and that's when they killed him. Something else interesting, and again, this is just speculation too, but sometimes you try to figure out, you know, was Jesus really killed on a Friday? And then put in the tomb, you know, Friday evening, just to, you know, maybe a couple hours, and then all day Saturday, and then for early Sunday, you know, does that make three days? Or maybe he was, you know, crucified on Thursday. Interesting thing, just a thought. Talking about the uh, Passover lamb, on the 10th of the month, you'll take that lamb and separate him onto your household. And then on the 14th of the month, the lamb is killed. And so if we were... Again, speculation, but interesting. If Jesus came into Jerusalem, the triumphant entry as we know it, on Sunday, if that was the 10th, then Monday would be the 11th, Tuesday 12, Wednesday 13, Thursday would be the 14th, the day that the lamb would be slaughtered. Don't know. Interesting, something to consider. If anybody figures it out, let me know. Verse 12 says that uh, they sought to lay hands on him but feared the multitude for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. Back in, again, back in chapter 11, uh, verse 18, it says after Jesus had cleansed the temple, it said the scribes and the chief priests sought how they might destroy him for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. So this is nothing new to them. This is the this is the heart that they have. They want to destroy Jesus. It's not just enough to kind of cast him out, but they want to put an end to him. Their nose is way out of, out of joint. Verse, um, okay, before we move on, as, as I read through this in verse 2, it talks how the, uh, the owner of the uh, vineyard wanted to receive some of the fruit from that vineyard. I think about that in terms of what does God want to receive from us? And so I started looking into uh, some of these things. And we're going to look at several scriptures here. Uh, let me read the first one to you in Matthew 7. It says, speak, this is speaking of the false prophets. Um, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. A good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. And when God created in the, um, the heavens and the earth, when he created trees you know, he created them after their own kind so that their their seed you know would produce like kind and we can see that that analogy carried into our Christian lives as as we have surrendered our our lives to him we produce after his kind and so God is producing wants to produce fruits in our lives that are his character um, Romans 7, 4 says, You have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, and married to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Let's everybody turn to John chapter 15, starting at verse 1. We continue with the fruit analogy. Jesus speaking to his disciples. <laughs> Jesus says in chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes or purges, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. And he who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If, anything, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them up and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. But it is God's desire, as well as Jesus Christ, that we bear fruit to the glory of the Father. Turn also to Galatians 5. Very familiar scripture. Maybe to the point that sometimes we read it and don't pay attention to it. But starting at chapter 16, or verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish to do. And if you are led by the spirit, and are not under the law, Well, I didn't read that right, did I? But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, now it makes sense to me. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries and the like of which I tell you beforehand just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God but the fruit of the Spirit after its own kind is love joy peace long-suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such there is no law and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And one more scripture verse. Let's turn to 2 Peter 1. Second Peter 1, verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, paying all attention, add to your faith virtue, moral excellence. Add to your moral excellence knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness, phileo love. To brotherly kindness, God's love, agape. And if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the interesting ones here <clears throat> is perseverance. And you could, some of your Bibles may say endurance or might say patience. This is a little different from being patient with a brother or sister in Christ, or anyone for that matter. This is with a situation or with circumstances, what we would know as trials or testings uh, or temptations when the temptation is not to sin, but a, a testing from God. And so what it's speaking of, that perseverance is learning not to push off the circumstance, but to carry that circumstance for a purpose in order that God may have his full intention and work into you what is needed, what he wants to add to you, but also with the intent that we might know him more intimately. Second Timothy 3.12 says, All who live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. So we see the fruits of the Spirit. This is somebody who's, you know, these are concerning people who are walking godly in Christ. These things are growing as we are abiding in Christ, as we are walking in the Spirit. 
God is working these things into the lives of his children. And as we do that, 2 Timothy tells us that we're going to suffer persecution for that fruit. I've been reading several books, Mary and I, and they're not about the same things exactly, but they, they're they kind of meshing together and giving us a a full picture, you know, a fuller picture of kind of what's going on in our world today. And as we've seen, the Supreme Court make some decisions that will begin to affect you and I on a very personal level in our relationships with people at work, in our neighborhood, anywhere we go as we conduct our lives in this world, in it but not of it. And so as the truth comes out, you know, our biblical worldview, our love of the gospel, our love of God, according to the scriptures, we will begin to find more and more a hostility towards us, a marginalization of us. It may affect us financially, job-wise, status, your reputation, all of these things that we tend to hold dear. Those are important things in a person's life. And I think that we'll begin to, and I don't mean to scare, it's not that, but it's to equip that we are ready as those times approach. <clears throat> the New Testament four times tells us that per persecution represents a blessing. Jesus told us twice in the Sermon on the Mount, um, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5.10. And then Matthew 5.11 says, blessed are you when reviled and persecuted with all manner of evil being spoken against you falsely on my account, verse 11. Uh, 1 Peter 3.14 says, If you suffer for righteousness' sake, blessed are you. And James 1.12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. And that speaks again of what we were just saying about being tried, being persecuted, but not trying to push it off. How can we push it off? We can say, you know what? Uh, I don't, I don't really believe that all that stuff about Jesus. You know, I, 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 some of it, we can deny him or we can seek any number of ways of being a Jacob, being a heel catcher, kind of scheming and conniving to get out from under it because it's uncomfortable. But in doing so, we miss its purpose. We miss the fact, remember Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. He's in the shadows. He's in the difficulty. He's in the suffering. He's not called a man of sorrows, a man of grief for nothing. He knows all of that. And he did all of that for you and I, you and me. Excuse me. He's there. And when we say, Lord, I'm going to do this with you. We're going to discover a much more intimate relationship with him because we're going to discover the power and the strength that he has for us to, ta to take us through that. And even if it means our life, he's there with us and he's there waiting for us like with Stephen the heavens opened up and he looked up and I see, I, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God the Father. Not sitting, standing, ready to welcome Stephen home. We in America have not had much of a taste of this. As soon as something starts getting heavy or hard, whoa, what's going on? You know, we, we start to freak. We want somebody to pray for us. Get this off my back. Get it off. You know. <laughs> and that's, that's natural. God is calling us to supernatural. To take it patiently and to find out 
more about him, what he wants to do in us, what he is able to do. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul gives his list of persecution and trials and sufferings. And in that, you know, I think it was uh, five times, 40 lashes, three times beaten with rods, one time stoned and left for dead. And then he goes on, he was shipwrecked, he faced dangers and hardships, hunger and thirst and exposure. All of these different things. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Through all of these, Paul grew more intimate in his understanding of his Savior. Philippians 3, verse 4. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he has confidence in the flesh, I more so. I was circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. All 613 laws, all 613 traditions I kept. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. And what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. We all have gain. Sometimes it's inherited, or some of it may be inherited. Some of it may be achieved. Your, your schooling, your degrees, um, your awards. Um, some of it may be bestowed on you. Talents that you've received from God. Um, financial, social improvements in your life. And gain, what we'll call there, all these things are gain, are not sinful. But when we come to Christ, as Paul did, he took all of those things and he said, I count them as loss. And like anything else, when we surrender to God, sometimes he will have you Surrender an aspect of your life or, or, or something in your life, a possession or something. Or a relationship. And it may, you know, you finally get to that place where you say, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want. And he asks it of you and you give it. And he may turn around like he did with Abraham and give him his son right back unharmed and he may do that just to see where is your heart will you obey me when I ask and it's such a joy you know he's not trying to hurt us he's trying to help us that's that's his father's heart toward us so this gain that we see here it may be required of us it may not be but the idea here is that gain needs to be valued differently. It doesn't, it can't be as important. In fact, for Paul, he called it dung. He called it um, rubbish. In fact, I think if you dig into the real meaning of it, it's gross and it's repulsive. And compared to Christ, that's what Paul thought of all his gain. He wasn't ungrateful for it, but the knowing of Christ fully surpassed what it was worth. And gain will uh, inhibit us from knowing him better. So there's two things about um, knowing Christ. Part of it is we share in his righteousness, our, our justification. When we come by faith to God and receive the gift of Christ and all that he has accomplished. 
we receive forgiveness of our sins, we receive his righteousness. We give him our sin, we get his righteousness. We're justified before the Father. And we know him in that way. And then there's another way of knowing him that goes deeper. For the first way is positional. That's our position in Christ. We are justified. And that's our initial meeting with Christ. But the second one is deeper. It's practical and intimate. And that is knowing Christ through experiencing the power of his resurrection and sharing in his sufferings. And if we do that prayerfully and in his power and carrying that test, carrying that weight, it's not for our pride. It's not our achievement because we will see that it, this is all Christ. This is all his grace. This is his power, his resurrection power giving me what I need. And I gain steadfastness. I gain perseverance. He's making me like himself. So not only do I know him now intimately, I'm becoming like him. There's fruit in my life. And you know what? The Father is glorified. The Father is pleased with that. So persecution and suffering bring blessing because they allow us to know Christ more intimately and become more like him. Okay. We're going to fly. Back to uh, Mark 12. Mark 12, verses uh, 13. It says, Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. Um, and that's when they, uh, they say to him, Teacher, we know that you're true and that you care for no one and that you do not regard a person of men, uh, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Interesting thing. Remember now, the... Uh, Herodians, political power. Pharisees, very religious power. What are the two of them doing together? But they ask this question concerning what do we do with our money? Do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? No matter, in their, th in their thinking, no matter how Jesus answers, one of those groups is going to triumph over him. So it's a trap set. You know, we've got him either way. If he says, pay Caesar, then the Pharisees will say, whoa, this guy's a traitor. If they say, don't pay Caesar, then they say, he's an uh, insurrectionist. And Jesus is doomed. But here we see the kind of the foolishness of God is so much greater than the, the wisdom of men. He answers them in such a way that they're just both, um, as verse 17 says, they marveled. How can this guy do this? So these guys are like oil and water, and they set this trap, and they use flattery. Um, and Jesus just nails them. Boom. Not a problem. Verse 18. Then some of the Sadducees, um, who believe that there's no resurrection come, and they asked him, you know, teacher, you know, a man marries a wife before they, she, you know, she conceives, he dies. You know, the guy has six other brothers, you know, and they all step up to bat, and uh, they all die. I'd get really leery if I was like the third or fourth brother. <laughs> I think I'd leave town, you know. <laughs> and this, this one is really kind of ironic, because they say in the, in the resurrection, whose wife is she? They don't even believe in the resurrection. Again, you know, no, no big deal. Jesus sees right through it. And he doesn't, he doesn't mock like I would. He doesn't have anything smart to say. He actually loves them in spite of them. And we see Jesus loving, in, in these cases, his enemies. 
They're out to destroy him. And yet he loves them and he instructs them. And here's his instruction. You're therefore mistaken because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they're neither married nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. The, um, the resurrection is not a restoration of life as we know it. It's a whole new life. It's a different life. Will we know each other? Oh, yeah. We have bodies. We don't know yet what they're going to be like. But they're going to be special. They're going to be great. We're going to be in his presence. So he instructs them. Um, verse 28. Then one of the scribes, and I'd have to think that he was, you know, standing close by, came and having heard, you know, of course he heard, he was standing close by. And they, they reasoning together, perceived that uh, he had answered them well. And he asked them, the, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him and said, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And that is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all of your heart and all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole of burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. What Jesus answered is what they call the Shema. And that literally says, Jehovah, our Elohim, our plural God, is one Jehovah. In this case, the scribe is starting to think outside the box that he has been grouped in, the box of the scribes of the day. Very tight-knit group, probably ostracized for thinking outside the box, for acting outside the box. But here he is, and he's starting to see, wow, there's wisdom coming out of this man's mouth. And starting to process the truth. We don't know what came of him. Great, you know, great possibility for uh, a talented writer to take something like this and follow up on it and just, you know, kind of see instruct us through it, you know, a fictional account or whatever. But uh, it says, after that, no one dared to question him. The inspection was complete. The lamb passed the test. He was without spot, without blemish. And finally, now to close, turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5, starting at verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came, and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God 
by your blood. You've redeemed us out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You've made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all of that that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever and then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever and ever. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you reveal yourself to us, that you instruct us, that you equip us, Father. That you give us understanding, Lord, beyond our own. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, Lord, for showing us your ways, instructing us in life. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the relationship that we have with you now through your son and through his shed blood. Father, that we can have forgiveness of sins Lord, that we are justified before you because of Jesus, our glorious Savior and elder brother. We are undeserving, Lord, but we thank you for that knowledge. We thank you that we can know him in this way. And Lord, as we see the days before us, Father, as they take their course. Like Anne Graham Lott said, Lord, the world may look like it's falling apart, but knowing you, it's falling together, just as you said it would. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to suffer for you, to endure persecution for you, and that is not spoken lightly, Lord, for in and of ourselves, we're failing. But we ask God that you would open to us new understanding, a new knowledge of Christ, our Savior, as we follow him, Lord. May we be found by your power, your resurrection power, Lord, to be faithful to persevere to your glory and to your praise and receive, God, the blessings that you have for those who are obedient. Heavenly Father, I ask your blessing on all of us, God, now as we spend a little time in fellowship, as we spend time you know, praying for one another. If any needs come up here to the front afterwards and we'll pray. Father, we ask that you would continue to minister by your spirit as we fellowship and as we pray together. And continue, Lord, to bring your word to mind that we may meditate on it and ruminate over it. Father, and grow thereby to your glory and to your praise until that day that we hear that trumpet and that shout and see a a flash, the twinkle of an eye, and be face to face with our great God and Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.